Um, before I move into my presentation, I would like to forward it by saying that this is a somewhat uh, risky and adventurous uh, venture on my part. I'm a historian of late imperial Russia, and so my inroads into contemporary Russian history are informed by sort of personal observation of the current situation, combined with attempts to um, think about these events through the lens of the historiography of the um, of new imperial history and the late imperial period. So please consider what follows as sort of polemical and introductory remarks um, on uh, Putinism. In the past decade and a half, most courses on contemporary Russian history or politics were organized around the theme of transition. A sizable literature grew um, on the various aspects of the concept of transition, but the lingering question remained uh, about what exactly was Russia transitioning to following the breakup of uh, the USSR. As the notion of the modern Soviet Union seamlessly transforming itself from a deviant um, to a normative and Western version of modernity became more and more problematic, um, so did the concept of transition. Now it seems we know exactly what the teleology of that transition was to an authoritarian, and some people would even say corporativist and fascist regime of personal rule by Vladimir Putin. Um, recently I was uh, working on developing a course at Amherst on the last 30 years of Russian and Soviet history, and I kept asking myself if it was a good idea to organize it around the questions of how and why this regime emerged, and what were the major historical forces and turning points that contributed to its current shape. Of course, such an approach has been thoroughly criticized in German and Soviet history, as much of the 20th century historiography uh, of Germany and the Soviet Union was written with the notion that everything that happened in the past, from Byzantine political theory to Ivan the Terrible, and from German classical philosophy to belated national unification of Germany, had an immediate and direct impact on the rise of Nazism and Stalinism. But the story of Putinism might be in a somewhat different uh, situation. As a matter of fact, there is no, not even a basic social or cultural history of the last Russian revolution. And our understanding of the late Soviet period, despite some inroads by anthropologists, remains at best very vague. Hence, um, I suggest it might be useful to ask ourselves how historians of the future might be ri writing the history of Putinism and its emergence. And of course, any historical statement uh, in contemporary situation is deeply embedded in immediate politics. Uh, Putin's regime itself has made history into one of the most important, if not the most important, instruments of self-legitimization. Displaying a ubiquitous appetite for the past, this omnivorous regime incorporated cults of late imperial politics and figures from Nicholas II to Pyotr Arkadyevich Stalipin um, to emigre conservative philosophers such as Ivan Ilyin or the Eurasianists. The, uh, 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 sort of the replacement of the Soviet holiday celebrating the great October Socialist Revolution on November 7th with a unity day hearkening back to the early 17th century expulsion of the Poles from the Kremlin during the time of troubles betrayed the anti-revolutionary and pro-stability anxieties and desires of the Kremlin politologists. Much has been written about um, the resurrection of the cult of the Great Patriotic War and the state's desire to establish a canonical story of heroic struggles and victory, essentially turning what was a civil war into a war of national uh, un unity. Pursued with the help of new technologies in what our deans today would, co would call digital humanities, these projects are sometimes truly impressive. Um, consider, for example, that Russia now has one of the most startling digital resources on World War II. Um, the site Pamit Naroda, or People's Memory, allows any person to search for relatives who served during World War II in the Soviet Army and view historical documents or parts of historical documents scanned with their names online. Um, there is actually no precedent in uh, Europe or the United States to this kind of engagement um, with um, the um, online uh, uh, resources or archiving, uh, presenting the archival resources online. A popular movement called uh, Immortal Regiment, which was started by activists in Tomsk several years ago, was incorporated into the state politics when Putin po personally joined thousands of people walking the streets of Moscow with portraits of their fallen uh, relatives. Even recent history, especially the 1990s, is on the agenda of contemporary Russian history makers. 
Although never explicitly stated by officials, the socio-economic crisis of the 1990s and the collapse of the state serves to underscore the order and stability of Putin's own rule. Of course, this ideological stance, a stance generates not less ideological responses of the liberal Russian intelligentsia, with the most visible instance being the recent I consider it somewhat bizarre flash mob online when primarily well-to-do Muscovites showed off photographs intended to demonstrate the that the 1990s were not the time of misery and suffering, as most Russians actually believe, but a period of unprecedented opportunity and freedom. And finally, uh, a series of projects are now run by the state or with implicit and explicit state support uh, to create a more acceptable for the Russian state interpretation of the conflicts over the meaning um, uh, of the 20th century in the former borderlands of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Alexander Dukov, um, a somewhat controversial historian who was recently denied uh, entrance to Estonia, and his foundation Historical Memory, with remarkable, and I would even say somewhat suspicious, access to Russian archives, um, actively published documents from the Soviet era, probably selective documents, damning national activists among the Estonians, Latvians, or Ukrainians. Um, and while everyone's attention is turned to the mindless propaganda of the Russian state, um, run media, which of course claim that fascists came to power in Ukraine, etc., Dukov's projects are much more subtle, professional, and require not less professional expertise to submit them to historiographic scrutiny. Now, given how central history is to the self-legitimization of Putin's regime, um, historicizing the, ri the rise of Putinism itself remains a challenge. Putin's regime is often described as a TV simulacrum, a mafia state, or even worse, a function of some mysterious resource-based economy. Journalists of better or worse quality look for problems in Putin's own past, as if his personality has the explanatory power to give us a clear, clear picture of the convoluted historical process of the fall of the USSR and the emergence of post-Soviet states and provide answers to basic historical questions. So uh, I want to move away from this narrative centered on Putin, and I'd like to uh, 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 sort of um, simulate what historians um, of the future would say about the conditions that made the rise of Putinism possible. Historians, of course, do a lot of things, but they still aspire to look at large-scale societal processes over time, and they are um, trying to be attentive to the historical agency of uh, as great a number of people as possible who participate in historical events. And while the danger of over-historicizing causal explanations remains, um, it is still fundamentally important to understand that Putinism is not an accidental phenomenon, a work of a bad guy who by chance was placed by aging Yeltsin on Russia's throne. Uh, these explanations are actually strikingly reminiscent of how Russia's post-revolutionary emigres looked at the revolution and saw it as the work of one particular evil genius, Lenin, sometimes assisted by another evil genius, Trotsky, and it had nothing to do uh, with anything else. It was a pure accident of history and could be reverted. So let me say a couple of things now about what I see as long-term structural elements uh, which contributed to the emergence of Putinism. Many of these elements were discussed in the late 1990s by historians in the framework of an aborted, yet really interesting uh, conversation uh, uh, centered on what we called back then Weimar Russia. Among the first such elements is the social history of Russia's democratic transformation, which is intellectually indebted to revisionist historians of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. The beginning of this social history should be sought back in the Soviet history of the second half of the 20th century. Let me explain why. As Vladislav Zubok has shown, the destalinization of the Soviet Union was as much a social as it was a political phenomenon. In the context of the Cold War, the dramatic expansion of the Soviet military industrial complex led to the emergence of the new Soviet middle class, or the ITR, the Ingenierne Technicheski Rabotniki, the engineering and technical personnel. Combined with the massively expanded research in sciences, this development resulted in unprecedented growth of what we could, could provisionally call Soviet, Soviet middle class. Employed by technical bureaus and factories, academic institutes and universities, the Soviet middle class was often called the technical intelligentsia, the technical intelligentsia in Soviet uh, parlance. 
Raised on Soviet Marxist ideas, it shared a belief in the power of science and technical progress, consumed Soviet culture on the edge of the permissible, listened to Western and Soviet semi-official music, and avidly read some is that. Neither in direct opposition to the Soviet regime, nor in full ideological commitment to it, the Soviet middle class did not experience the Western intellectual revolutions of the 1960s. In the early 1990s, it was still peculiarly out of sync with the intellectual um, um, developments in the rest of the world. As Mark Lipovetsky has convincingly, in my view, argued, the culture of uh, the technical intelligentsia was suffused with Soviet notions of progressorship and was characterized by essentialist understanding of human collectivities, such as nations, conservative vision of culture, and biologized um, vision of, of view of gender. Whatever claims Russian philologists made about the parallel development of, of structuralism in the USSR, Soviet intellectual life actually never experienced um, the sustained critique of the Enlightenment, which permeated Western intellectual life in the second half of the 20th century. It would not be very difficult to imagine that it was exactly this class of people um, that became the driving force, the social backbone of the Soviet democratization in the late 1980s. As it enthusiastically responded to Gorbachev and became gradually disillusioned with the politics within the Soviet framework, the Soviet urban middle class was anything but apolitical. And I think it's a very, very important point because much of what Putinism is about is this notion of drastic depolitization of uh, uh, people, especially in comparison to what we see in Ukraine. Um, the, um, uh, new, the Soviet middle class staunchly supported new democratic groups and parties, rallied around Yeltsin as the Soviet Union entered its last days. As Russian intellectuals today bemoan the apolitical stance of the population and demobilization, it is worth remembering that in the late 1980s, the Soviet urban class was um, anything but demobilized. Rapid self-organization around progressive ideas, reflected in parties such as Democratic Fronts and nationalist sentiment of the organization PAMIT and such, translated into participatory politics. Curiously, the indirectly elected Congress of People's Deputies um, was more, in some ways more democratic and I would even say progressive than the directly elected post-Soviet parliament, maybe due to the secured representation um, of bastions of the Soviet middle class, such as the Academy of Sciences, which could elect its own, its own deputies. But the very success of the democratic politics proved to be its undoing. We don't have much space here to discuss the peculiarity of the Russian uh, post-Soviet economic reform. We can just note that it was probably an important factor that major developing, developed countries were then led by um, conservative and pro-market politicians, except probably France's socialist president. The uh, predominance of the neoliberal consensus contributed to the ideas central to Russia's econo economic reforms. Rapid transition to market economy known as shock therapy, liberalization of prices and trade, and rapid privatization. The latter in particular proved to be very important and had, had fundamental political consequences for the emergence of Putinism, as we will see later. Fearful of the possible return of communists, the engineers of Russian economic reforms insisted on massive and cheap transfer of the national economy into the private hands in the hope that it would create a class of property owners invested in democratic transformation. The overall result of, this, of the reforms was a massive contraction of the GDP, collapse of the welfare provisions of the Soviet era, st staggering drop in life expectancy, and most importantly, the destruction of the economic and social base of the former Soviet middle class. By 1996, the key year for understanding the emergence of Putinism, because this is the year when elections became meaningless in the Russian Federation, they were heavily manipulated, and as recently uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky uh, revealed in a fascinating interview, actually directly forged, the outcome, the outcome of, the, of the elections um, ha had been forged. Um, Yeltsin's presidency was then facing a staggeringly low 3% appro approval rating and the virtual disappearance of its social base upon which the democratic politics was based. As Max Weber would say, if he studied the Russian reforms the way he studied the Russian Revolution of 1905, Russian liberals came to hang in the air. <laughs> 
despite the broad national consensus, based as it is in lived experience, that the economic policies of the 1990s had disastrous social consequences, Russian liberals continue to defend them in the face of the obvious, providing Putin's regime with one of its most valuable tools, the negative support of the broad segments of population, fearful of the return of these destructive policies. I would argue that the historical trajectory of the Soviet middle class created by the context of the Cold War competition and destroyed by the triumph of neoliberal version of capitalism constituted one core threat in, in the rise of Putinism and provided it with unwavering, even if negative, support for almost two decades now. The second core threat in the history of Putinism as a historical phenomenon lies in the realm of political economy of the late Yeltsin's and early Putin's regime. The conundrum of the disappearing social base of democratic politics was resolved by Yeltsin supporters in a series of interrelated measures, which, with the wisdom of the hindsight, appear as a coordinated attempt to curb popular representation and make it less and less meaningful. These measures include the dispersal of the parliament in 1993, the rapid distribution of national wealth to politically connected businessmen, and the manipulation of the presidential elections of 1996. As the popular discontent regarding the economic policies of the government mounted, the conflict between the presidential administration and the deputies of the parliament was resolved by force. A um, new constitution with superpowers for the president was promoted as a means to curb the red-brown threat. Um, the much taunted return of the communists in alliance with the nationalists. The constitution created the basis for um, an authoritarian regime in which alternative centers of power, such as the Federation Council or State Duma, enjoyed influence but could easily be dismissed, which is what happened in Putin's time. The substantiation uh, for the new constitution, as it was laid out by Sergei Shahrai and others at the time, consisted in the argument that a strong presidential authority was absolutely required to push through difficult and unpopular economic reforms. As Shahrai explained in his interview in 2013, and Sergei Shahrai is one of the two authors who actually penned down the text of the Russian constitution of 1994. Um, uh, in the con this is the citation from, from his interview. In the conditions of the era of reforms, the president had to take upon himself many difficult decisions connected with the pushing through of the reforms. The parliament did not pass necessary laws in the area of socioeconomic construction or in the realm of federative relations. The government also avoided unpopular decisions. As a result, the president had to act to push the changes through um, his own decrees. So what were these um, unpopular decisions that the president had to push through? The central of them was the shady and opaque privatization of the second half of the 1990s, which transferred, in exchange for political support of the presidency, the bulk of the national economy into private hands. Much has been written of Putin's conflict with the oligarchs. And yet, although individual wealthy businessmen, such as Gusinsky and Ber or Berezovsky, suffered persecution or exile, at no point in its history did Putin's regime raise the idea of revisiting the sale of the century. Following the privatization of the 1990s, Russia emerged as a country with one of the greatest levels of inequality in the world, with several hundred individuals controlling the bulk of the national economy. The super-presidential Republic of Yeltsin, uh, of course, in decline after 1996, um, continued to guard new regimes of property throughout Putin's years. Curiously, even during the conflicts between Putin on the one hand and Berezovsky, Gusinsky, or later Khodorkovsky on the other, the issue of re-evaluation of the privatization of the 1990s was never raised by the representatives of um, the government. The only political force in Russia which drew attention to the lingering problem of illegitimate property was Yevlinsky's Yablaka, now practically defunct on uh, the national political scene. Now, the political and the economic outcome of the privatization placed the holders of property in a subservient relationship to the personalized state, while the latter continues to guarantee the legacy of this state auctioneering. The role of late Yeltsinism and early Putinism in particular as the guardians of the new economic um, order requires, of course, more research and discussion. 
but it clearly is a central element upon which rests the power of Russian authoritarianism. There is a reason why the Russian state continuously fails to defend and promote small and medium businesses, while the enormous concentration of property under state control ensures that no alternative sources of political mobilization could emerge. Now, the last, um, and maybe some people would argue the most fascinating aspect in the rise of Putinism, which I would like to discuss, can be termed the postmodern demobilization under, uh, under Putin. We are all familiar with the peculiar aspects of contemporary Russian regime um, and its use of the flows of information. Bewildering combination of ideas, contexts, images, often fabricated, the full subjugation of foreign and domestic policy to the trans TV transmitted picture characterize the political technology of Putin's rule. This is probably the most uh, 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 mass media uh, sort of attuned regime in history in some ways. The architects of Putin's information state, Vladislav Surkov, whom Professor Treisman ma mentioned, and Oleg Pavlovsky, with their newfound commitment to a postmodern primacy of the text, managed to create a realm in which any verification is impossible. They do not argue that the Russian state is right or that the particular Putinist version of events um, is correct. What they argue instead, of course, is, is that no one is right and that the multitude of versions of truth is a no normal state of affairs. Probably equally rooted in the late Soviet cynicism and possibly even in particular forms of Soviet um, sense of humor, um, and the Western criticism of stable narratives which became available in post-Soviet Russia. The postmodern Putinism cannot be checked by developed expert-based or professional discourses on history or politics. As the campaign of the Dissernet clearly illustrated, and Dissernet is a group of Russian uh, uh, activist scholars who are trying to deal with the problem of plagiarism, uh, staggering actually levels of plagiarism um, in Russian academic degrees. It turns out that it's not just peculiar to politicians who buy uh, dissertations, PhD dissertations for themselves, but increasingly it's becoming clear that it's a phenomenon deeply rooted in post-Soviet academia. Um, the, as the activity of this group of, of people who are trying to scrutinize um, uh, uh, the dissertations clearly illustrated the collapse of professional communities in social sciences and in humanities is almost complete in Russia. Uh, and um, the collapse of Soviet institutions, publishing houses and such, with their attending professional censorship, led to an explosion of the market of information. An ordinary, ordinary educated Russian is treated to a diet of fascist classics, neo-Stalinist fantasies, fake barrier diaries, which you could buy in Moscow, for example, in four volumes. Mind it, four volumes of fake, fake diaries, which cover almost a decade of Beria's life, um, published by a gentleman with an interesting pseudonym, Sergei Kremlev. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, uh, in practically any bookstore in the country, with the exception of two or three intellectual bookstores, of course, one is startled by omnipresence of what would normally be marginal texts on the outskirts of the textual world. So, uh, the, um, um, some of us remember famous Lenin's work, the uh, three sources and three constitutive elements of Marxism, three источники и три составные части марксизма. I would argue that the three uh, sources and three constitutive elements of Putinism, the collapse of the Soviet middle class and the reforms of the 1990s, the emergence of the super presidential republic serving as the guarantee of the new socio-economic order, and the postmodern destabilization of um, any, any possibility of a meaningful and rational conversation about history or politics uh, without any sort of an accompanying public commentary rooted in expertise um, continue to inform Putinism and its constant adaptation to changing political and economic situation. They contribute powerfully to the perennial self-deprivation of agency and the construction of post-Soviet subjectivity, a very familiar Soviet trope which translates in sort of colloquial language, it doesn't matter uh, whether we vote, protest, participate in politics, it's going to be the same. Uh, essentially something that Nancy Rees called the um, Russian form of lamentation. But I think it has a political meaning, it has a meaning of self-deprivation of agency. Um, and so 
the, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, three parts of Putinism continue to ensure that political self-mobilization and self-organization remains highly local and generally invisible and illegible uh, to most Russians. The emergence of a more universal, recognizable political language which would be able to articulate these highly local concerns of a disoriented and disjointed society remains a challenge, and I think that reflecting on those factors that shaped Putinism in its current form as a historical phenomenon, not uh, as a product of Putin's peculiar personality, uh, should be one of the first steps. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to talk. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot see you at the moment, so um, it will be a little bit free. Uh, but, but the topic is surreal now. <laughs> so, uh, the, the title of my paper, rather of my notes, comes from one unforgettable uh, situation. Uh, when after a talk uh, that I gave uh, on basically the main subject of my studies, um, culture of the besieged uh, in Grad during the siege, um, in situ during the events. So after the talk, uh, a very um, polite and gentle manly gentleman uh, walked in and asked, uh, thank you, he said, for uh, illuminating uh, talk, uh, but I just have one question to ask. Would you please uh, clarify, is the siege of Leningrad for yet? <laughs> uh, at first, I, I found uh, this remark to be uh, kind of touching and absurd, uh, but the more I thought about it, um, the one understood that actually this question makes a lot of sense. Uh, because the further we are in history uh, from these events, uh, the more complicated they, see, they seem to be, uh, less clarity we have uh, about them, curiously enough, paradoxically enough, and also more prominence and more importance uh, these events seem to have in our um, uh, historiography uh, and political history today in Putin's Russia, I would say. So uh, I decided to bring to your attention some of the uh, situations, uh, some of the scenarios that might um, explain something to us about this topic, or maybe they will rather problematize uh, this question and the events. So uh, let me uh, remind you, uh, so I, I fully understand that most of the people uh, in the audience um, do not need this reminder, and nevertheless, um, the siege of Leningrad uh, that lasted from September 8th of 1941 uh, to January 1944, uh, we counted as the most uh, voluminous scale event of its kind in modern history, uh, the, the uh, gravest military siege that uh, took the most lives to pen. Uh, we do not know some lives. Uh, it took, and this is one of many questions uh, that produce, uh, I would say, sharp debates uh, between historians uh, today, and I will go to this topic later. The bracket is that uh, the lowest bracket is around 600,000 victims, and the highest bracket is twice as much. Um, uh, more than a million, a million and a half. Um, so, uh, one very important thing to mention, uh, and maybe th this is how my talk um, can be useful to your conversation tonight and tomorrow, because it seems to be case study, right? 
siege of Leningrad, one of many disasters of the Soviet history, in a long durée of the Soviet history. Why is it interesting to study it uh, for the conference on Putinism? Um, siege uh, of Leningrad is indeed a curious case uh, in terms of its politics then and now, in terms of its historiography then and now. Um, people really get surprised uh, and kind of freeze uh, when I, in our discussions um, I, I tell them, I suggest uh, with my colleagues that, um, that the, the siege is a historical problem and uh, we know very little about it, because simultaneously it absolutely should be said uh, that siege is one of the most famous uh, events of the 20th century, not only infamous, but famous. Uh, and it produced its own writing in every possible discipline and genre, not from its beginning, but before it began, which is curious, already in the summer of 1941, uh, interpretations that began emerging. Uh, so when we say, and there is one of those uh, formulas uh, used generously these days, the unknown siege, неизвестная uh, блокада, people become puzzled. Uh, what do you mean? Um, and what we mean by that is that they exist simultaneously to texts, to interpretations, to readings of the siege. Um, one, as I just mentioned, is the official one, uh, the public version of the Soviet propaganda. Uh, and what is also very uh, important to understand uh, for your conversation that this official public version of Soviet propaganda is very much alive today. And preparing for this talk, uh, I listened to several broadcasts on the Vingrad radio and was kind of astonished <laughs> that rhetoric uh, in 2016 basically uh, mirrors directly what was written by the propaganda makers in Leningrad uh, in 1941. And the main um, moments of coinage, the main figures of the siege rhetoric uh, is the idea that the besieged Leningrad was the front city uh, that participated very actively in the combat, uh, and uh, uh, consequently, uh, people who lived in this city also actively participated in the combat, led uh, by the party, Communist Party organization in the city, and leaders of the Communist Party organization in the city, mainly uh, Zhdan himself, but also his close self. People like Kuznetsov, uh, Kolfin, Vesnesensky. Uh, and um, th this version of events uh, emerged very quickly, I would say, by, what, by early autumn of 1941. This is how the city was represented, and the siege experience was represented. And uh, today we fully can observe its repercussions. And there exists a different siege, Nipotsuzurna uh, version of the siege events and siege experience, uh, which was not published for decades, could not be published for decades of the Soviet regime, uh, with its own questions, its own ideas, uh, its own um, agents of writing and sense making. I would put it this way. Um, situation changed radically, obviously, when archives went open 
Uh, and it's also important uh, to stress that, as uh, most of you in the room know, the archives never were opened fully. They are still very much uh, only partially accessible for us, which creates all kinds of problems and questions. And uh, this siege, the other siege that um, my colleagues and I are trying to research, presents um, its own problems. The main problem being uh, that uh, the city was absolutely not prepared for what happened. And uh, when very late, disastrous, too late, um, government began dealing basically with the situation, the way in which it dealt with the situation uh, tells us all kinds of important uh, things uh, about uh, the Soviet uh, system, functioning of the Soviet system in crisis. Uh, for example, uh, people like Irina Sandomirska uh, wrote about um, the system of rations, not during the siege, uh, in using the framework of biopolitics. Um, and indeed, uh, when we look at what happened, that basically um, only people who got rabochi kartach, if the girl has directions, uh, with all kinds of bonuses, not bavki, only those people were allowed to survive, basically, and people around them, old people, uh, obviously children and teenagers, but also people of professions that were deemed not useful, i.e. intelligentsia, were declared to be ishdivyentsia, and basically this was capital punishment. Uh, this is something uh, that uh, came into the light uh, when archives, various archives in the city became uh, accessible. And this is something, this is the other siege. Another, th and I would say this is uh, one of the most complicated topics, governance in the city. Uh, and uh, in, in connection with what I just said, faiths the people um, regarded as not useful, and to what extent these people can be pronounced as faithsy. Uh, since most of them, we're talking again about hundreds of thousands, if not more, most of them basically uh, spent four or five months, if that, disappearing in the dark and cold apartments. In connection with the last of topics uh, that came to the light, and that is hugely problematic for discussion today, uh, is actually the city that was uh, largely left to its own devices. Uh, to survive was survived. So the question is how? The answer is the black market. The functioning of the black market uh, in the besieged Leningrad, which uh, to this day remains a very, uh, let's put it mildly, touchy topic and largely unstudied. Uh, again, because uh, though from all kinds of diaries and materials of witness were accepted, it was huge and crucial survival. But our access to archival, our limited access to archival materials uh, makes this situation questionable. So, Going back to where I started, two sieges, two representations, two views uh, uh, that coexist uh, in uh, the discussion, in the debate about the siege today. And by the way, as I just said, um, for me, <laughs> as a person who studies this topic, uh, obviously, uh, um, this is very uh, central and special, but it is also important to understand the context that uh, siege belongs to the number of, um, I would say, topics under suspicion in Putin's Russia 
for example, uh, recently uh, a rather curious situation happened in Petersburg uh, when a historian uh, was defending a dissertation uh, dedicated to Vlasov's army. Uh, which, by the way, the disaster of Vlasov's army, the so-called betrayal, took place uh, during the Leningrad battle. Uh, so, together with the Vlasov's uh, betrayal, which um, is only maybe one of the most flagrant episodes of the huge topic of occupation, um, and what we should talk about, so collaboration uh, during the Second World War and uh, the topic of land. And again, we're talking about millions and millions of people. Also, we can add here, of course, uh, uh, all uh, layers of the events connected to the Holocaust, rather Holocaust in the territory of the Soviet Union. These are topics that are difficult today the main frame, I would say, for the main frame of his uh, historiographical frame, that is rehearsing the history of the Second World War. Again, very politically, or should we call it patriotic war, great patriotic war, question mark, uh, as a victorious uh, narrative. Uh, and uh, this is a different topic, absolutely belonging to your discussion. This is a larger topic. Uh, and Siege of Europe is only its own weird niche in this conversation, but as I said, a peculiar niche where this desire uh, to see the um, participation of Soviet Union in that war as simply, directly victorious comes into certain kind of clash when we look closely at uh, certain events that took uh, place in the city from 1941 to 1944. So uh, with this being said, I would like to remind us about several recent events. Uh, actually, all of them are events from 2014. Yeah. Uh, when um, the uh, anniversary of the 70th anniversary of the uh, final ending uh, of the siege uh, took place and was uh, celebrated. So uh, uh, here are some of these events uh, which I thought would be curious and um, Oh, for your discussion, for our thinking about it. Maybe the most loud uh, and, I don't know, <laughs> the uh, most amount of noise in every meaning of the word uh, came from the somewhat uh, unexpected, uh, unplanned source. And since you have of Kostya Kuchkin and Maria Stepanova um, in the, among the presenters uh, as uh, two specialists on Putin's media. Uh, so, so these are the people who can fully um, educate us on this event. What happened is that uh, there uh, emerged a call uh, created by the internet TV channel DORT Array um, in January, <laughs> around the dates of the celebration of the anniversary, which uh, was perceived as especially uh, blasphemous. And the question was, um, I, I spent now 15 minutes trying to translate the original question. The, the question is, why it's so difficult? The question and question is, what do you think about the fact that you need to give the city? Do you think that it will save a lot of lives? 
Um, the question uh, existed uh, as a poll for 10 minutes, then it was removed. And what is also remarkable that a huge number of people who um, answered this question actually agreed that maybe it, would, it could be that a good idea if Leningrad would have been occupied. So what happened after that was a huge scandal. Uh, and later, in the conspirological um, spirit, I would say, <laughs> time, uh, there was even an idea that the question was planted uh, by the enemies of uh, those, uh, which at that point was one of the, and still is, uh, basically survived this disaster, uh, one of the sources of uh, liberal thought. Uh, so, um, what actually happened that several uh, channels uh, decided not to support uh, those anymore, and actually there was a popular outrage against this question, um, which I then uh, found uh, to be rather curious. Uh, because um, this is the question that one finds in every seed diary uh, that I saw, that I read. It's basically one of the kind of one of the topic, one of the, if I might say so, cliches of the siege political thought, obviously, understandably. Uh, and this question uh, can be debated. Um, I found it to be very, again, not a problem, one would think not a problem at all. But in the context of um, the recreated, of the context of, in the context of recreation of the narrative, of the total unified, uh, unique heroism, uh, of course, this question was interpreted as blasphemous, impossible, anti-historical, and so on. Uh, and maybe uh, for many people uh, who observed that celebration, that anniversary, this moment became symptomatic. Though there were other forms to celebrate. Uh, for example, uh, the rain, the dosh scandal kind of outshadowed um, a much more diligently prepared uh, way to celebrate the anniversary is curious uh, by uh, a rather curious uh, director, Alexander Vilidinsky, or Vilidinsky pronounced, um, who before that became a problematic favorite of uh, the new intelligence. Uh, uh, with his adaptation and, uh, of the, the film Yograf uh, Lobus Proto, um, much discussed. Uh, and many uh, saw uh, the fact that Vilikinsky was entrusted uh, to prepare this TV series as possibly uh, kind of uh, moving the topic of the siege towards the questions of uh, intelligence and everything. It absolutely, what actually happened is remarkably far uh, from these expectations. Uh, and I found a lot of both um, disappointing, uh, surprising, and uh, exciting in what it does. Uh, basically, uh, the TV series has very little to do uh, with the siege, uh, known to those who work with the actual. Um, materials, historical materials. Veridinsky turns uh, the siege into an action uh, TV series. Uh, and um, the main uh, group of uh, agents are agents indeed. Again, uh, we know from writing by Marty Pagetsky, many other sources from just um, sheer act of persuasion. One has carried to observe that, uh, that uh, the main heroes, uh, very important heroes of uh, Russian TV today, 
various внутренние органы. So what health is free of count intelligence, контрразведка, that work in order to prevent a certain disastrously villainous plan by Nazis against the city. I find to be curious that the team of the authors needed to invent the villainry against the new crowd. One would think there was enough of that. But that merges this idea that Nazis, German troops throughout the city, decided to poison the city with oranges. So they are sent in huge numbers, but of course, brave, impeccably brave and impeccably zealous, бдительные контрразведчики, they understand that апельсины не к добру. So basically, it all how should I put it? And if again the notion of happy ending can be married to the siege narrative. Another thing that I found again, I won't call myself a specialist on the siege film. It would be a somewhat a daring statement, but and if. And if I would like to do that, there should be clarification that there exist um, three movies made during the siege of Leningrad, which makes this task somewhat simpler, one would think. Uh, but one thing that one notices when uh, studying the fiction films, Kudor's uh, uh, film production from the siege, that for obvious reasons, these movies were not uh, shot in the city. Right? Vilitinsky um, film doesn't show us the city at all, uh, which, uh, with two minor exceptions. Um, it's this uh, film to celebrate the siege of Leningrad, its tragedy, that basically doesn't show us uh, the city, but shows a lot of contrarazvetka. Uh, and responses to it were rather disappointed, though actors whom he chose are the leading actors of the film and theater today. So, again, a kind of reaction of puzzle. And the third story, again, around 2014, around the 70th celebration moment, is the idea that there should be a museum. This is interesting and this is very important. And um, as I just uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I, I had a somewhat fantastical pleasure of listening to lots of radio and I just found for myself a remarkable Slava Sachitania coinage that uh, uh, with lots of excitement, the people who work at the museums, historical museums of Leningrad, say that they think there is a hope, they think there will be a new museum, and they repeat all the time with kind of a special burning, this love the Chitania, Poruchenia Presidenta. So I just uh, listened to this. A wonderful program called Historyski Chas, an hour of history. What was remarkable that several people would repeat to each other, but we have Poruchenia President. So basically, Poruchenia President took place, and Putin pronounced that there should be a siege museum. And actually, the the what is interesting, so. Now it's 2016, um, though it is known that a huge amount of money was delegated uh, to the 
governance of St. Petersburg, was in any town, nothing really happened. Uh, even the competition concourse um, of designs uh, went on its beginning stages, which I find to be uh, really strange. And um, But some ideas emerged, and they are curious. Uh, uh, but the question is where this museum uh, should happen, in the place of the original museum, uh, which was opened uh, in 1944, immediately, actually even before the uh, last events of the siege. And it was tragically shot in 1949, as we remember with Ringrad's Cathedral, and everybody who participated in this museum was arrested. Uh, so whether the museum should be there in Selenoy Gradok, where now we have a very, very remarkably strange museum, mostly controlled by Vajene, or whether there should be a new museum on the territory of Park Pagede, the Moscow uh, region neighborhood, Moscow's Krajane, to the south of the city, on the place where, which was actually the main burial place, the main ravine for the victims. It wasn't Piskaryovsky, but it was there. Uh, so this discussion was very curious whether the memory of the first tragic museum should be celebrated slash mourned, or whether a completely new thing should emerge and what should uh, happen there. So the discussion began and then kind of disappeared. Uh, and these three events, I would say, of confusion, of um, abrupt, uh, interrupted discussions, I think the overall sensation of confusion. Uh, and on the one hand, there is Polichini Presidenta, and there is involvement in even one would think commitment of the various forms of governance to this topic. But somehow, in many, many cases, um, it kind of goes into the sand. Uh, Jenny, how much time do we have? Uh, uh, very little. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me be brief. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to show you two books. Uh, I know it's kind of a cute moment, uh, show and tell. Uh, but these are very important for me. Uh, the one is, uh, the first one is the Leningrad Blockade 1941-1944 uh, by the team of uh, Richard Bidlack and Nikita Lamagin. And the other one is, uh, most, many of you might know it probably, it's Повседневная жизнь блокадного Ленинграда by Сергей Яр. Um, so uh, I, to kind of continue and develop uh, this uh, conversation, I would say that very interesting um, debate, historiographical debate is taking place. Very interesting people are participating in it. Uh, what the Lamagian project does, it publishes uh, NKVD material. And uh, with all the questions that everybody in the room, that I don't say at the moment, might have <laughs> about their authenticity and the extent to which we should or should not trust them, how can we corroborate them, uh, how these materials uh, were actually, how they put it, um, the bottom. How were получены эти отчеты и эти материалы? And nevertheless, we all do understand uh, that these are very important materials and they give us information indeed. Uh, it just, it's a great important question uh, how one should work with this information. Uh, Yarov's project, Sergei Yarov died um, in September last year uh, in his early 50s. And uh, was the person, by the way, philologist by training, was the person who maybe read uh, more archives of the siege than anybody. He never touched an NKVD archives. He worked in Zgali, he worked in Publichka, he worked in the party archive. Um, 
And his project works on the attempt, and maybe it's the biggest project uh, it was, uh, trying to um, ask questions about the siege as a human catastrophe. Um, some of these questions were asked, uh, I would say, rather shyly, timidly, but they were formulated. And I see it as a very important step. And these are two main directions and two main moments of discussion where things are at the moment. So since I'm approaching some kind of coda at the moment, um, I would like to end with, again, I started with an attempt of anecdote. I will end there. Um, and I will also, what I will tell now is, it's supposed to be somewhat embarrassing, but uh, most of you in this room know that uh, I write about the siege also as a poet. Uh, and this is another topic that I wanted uh, to um, share with you today, but of course ran out of time. A uh, very interesting role that siege plays in uh, new literature and poetry today. Uh, but I want, so um, I wrote a play about the siege called Kablo Vivan, Jevoy Kartina. It was staged in Moscow. And I found it extremely interesting uh, that uh, among the responses uh, to this uh, play, uh, there were uh, kind of different attempts to use it by every possible side of the political spectrum. Uh, and uh, when people who uh, put this uh, play on stage, like Jenny Mironov, uh, the main director of Theater Nazi, uh, when they asked me what should uh, they say at the interviews after the first night, I basically repeated, I asked him to read my lips, I wrote in capital letters, tell them they were not heroes, tell them it's not about heroism. This is one thing I want to kind of help as a result of my tiny play. So the next day, what happens, it goes as news on Tierme Canal. The television and the kind of opening phrase of extremely uh, sweet voiced commentator is Atipie. I understood that uh, narratives are stronger than us. Thank you.